Okay, perfect, perfect. Awesome. It looks like we're Morgan, we're missing a few people. Oh, they're just logging on now. Okay. Yeah, so Morgan, let me know. Let, let me start by sharing the screen if you want. This way we can, yeah, there you go. So I think we're live now. Okay. Um, welcome everybody. Uh, my name is Adrian Dan, and along with Matt Martin, uh, we are the co-directors of the START program, and uh, we welcome everybody to another edition of um, of the webinars for the START program. And in this edition, uh, we'd like to welcome Dr. Maher El Char. Dr. Um, El Char is uh, a star, not a rising star. He is a star in oh. the <laughs> in the world of bariatric surgery. If you read the literature, if you attend the national meetings, you've, you've seen his work. And he is the fellowship director and associate professor of surgery at St. Luke's University Hospital and Health Network in Beehive Valley. And, um, you know, everybody can do the easy operations and the primary procedures, but only a few people can do the really tough challenges. And that's why Dr. Elchar is here to uh, give us his tips, tricks, and um and um, pearls on how to manage these uh, difficult challenges and management of bariatric complications in, um, in, uh, with robotic surgery. So without further ado, uh, we're gonna have an interactive session here. Uh, I'd like to welcome and give the podium to uh, Dr. Alchara Amahara, welcome. Thank you, Adrian. Can you guys uh, hear me okay? Good, yeah. perfect. So Adrian, thank you so much. Uh, it's truly an honor and a pleasure to be part of this uh, start program. And I had the chance to talk to some of the fellows uh, before we started. And, um, um, you know, I, I'm hoping um, uh, this will be very uh, interactive. I have a few slides to start uh, just to give everyone uh, some background information, kind of like set the stage to what we're doing and why we're doing it this way. And then at the end, I'll show some videos and then open it to discussion, talk about technique, port placement, docking, stuff like that, because that's what truly really matters. Uh, I'm not gonna, I don't have time to go over data in details, but I wanna show some landmark papers and talk talk about some of our data that we published, you know, um, a, about management of bariatric complications and uh, revisions, just again, to set the stage before we start looking at, uh, you know, techniques and go over some uh, tips and pitfalls. Uh, so again, uh, thank you, Adrian. And uh, uh, let me share to start my disclosure slide. Obviously I'm a uh, proctor and speaker for Intuitive, but uh, I'm not here to convince you uh, to do uh, robotic. You're obviously part of the START program and uh, you're seeing some value in that, uh, but I will uh, truly share my experience in terms of why I like to approach those very complicated cases. Uh, robotically. At this point, I'm doing everything robotically, but if you ask me about the value of robotic, um, you know, it's truly in those very complicated, very challenging cases. That's where uh, the robot truly shines as compared to doing a simple sleep that takes you 20 minutes, even if you're doing it laparoscopically. So saying that, uh, you know, uh, as an introduction, uh, you guys all know that robotic uh, surgery has been around. I call it robotic assisted or RA. It's been around for some time, but in metabolic and bariatric surgery, robotic uh, surgery uh, only uh, uh, made its debut in the past, like maybe 10 or 12 years. Uh, and early on, there's only uh, a few surgeons doing that, but uh, over time, we've seen a, a, a significant increase in the number uh, of uh, cases that are done robotically. If you look at the MBS AQIP data, and we published a paper recently looking at what we call robotic utilization back in 2015, we looked at MBS AQIP data between 2015 and 2020, and we found that in 2015, the number of cases uh, performed robotically was only 6%. Now, it was a little bit higher than that because some of those cases were not entered in MBS AQIP, but if you look at MBS AQIP database, it was 6%. Fast forward 2020, it's almost 16%. So the number is going 
uh, up significantly. Now, saying that though, robotic surgery is not the standard of care. And uh, robotic assisted surgery remains very controversial because of cost issues, because of issues uh, in terms of outcomes. Uh, is it better? Is it not? And obviously efficiency. Uh, the the, the uh, take home message though, if you look at that paper that we published recently is that the use of robotic surgery is actually slightly higher in uh, what we call RBS or revision of bariatric surgery. And that has to do with the fact that those cases are very, very challenging. So surgeons out there are looking for a different platform to overcome some of those challenges. Now to go over the numbers again, if you look at the revisions Back in 2011, it was only 6%. 2019, it's up to 16.7%. So the numbers are going up. Now, the visions is kind of like a big umbrella. If you look at the 2020 MBS AQIP now, those cases are being split into revisions and conversions. The visions are kind of like what you would call like corrections. Uh, conversions are maybe band to sleeve, sleeve to bypass, bypass to BPT. Uh, those were basically lumped with uh, revisions, but now in the 2020 MBS equip, they're being divided into uh, revisions and conversions. So I'm saying that just so that you won't be confused when you look at those papers coming, in, coming out. Now those are being separated into uh, revisions and conversions. Nonetheless, for your own uh, purpose. The non-primary cases are going up. It was 6% back in 2011, 16.7 in 2019. If you look at the numbers that are published by ASMBS on its website, 2020, the numbers are down and that has to do with COVID obviously. So instead of 256 cases that we did back in 2019, the number was less than 200,000 cases. And if you divide 22,000 revisions by almost 200,000 uh, cases, it's around 11%. So the number of revisions, conversions took a hit in 2020, but nonetheless, compared to 2011, you see that there's a significant uptake in the number of those cases. Now, when we talk about revisions and conversions, why are we doing those cases? And mostly it's weight gain. We used to call it weight gain. You can call it recidivism, but the SMBS recommends now that we call it WR or weight recurrence. Uh, weight recurrence meaning either inadequate weight loss or weight gain over time. Uh, call it WR. But in addition to that, what we're dealing with is long-term complications like GERD, stricture, hernias, ulceration. These are very procedure specific. You know, we're seeing a lot of GERD, hernias, sleeve migration or sleeve. And at least in my practice, I see tons of chronic ulcers, strictures, perforations, uh, internal hernias with the bypass. So depending on the case, uh, you, you're going to have to deal with those long-term complications over time, whether you like it or not. So it's something to keep in mind. And, and, and the one thing that we all know from doing those cases, that those cases can be technically <coughs> challenging. Uh, you know, doing a sleeve, doing a bypass is one thing, but doing a VBG conversion to a bypass or sleeve migration into the chest or maybe a large esophageal uh, diverticulum or chronic ulcer, chronic fistula, these are extremely difficult cases. But despite that, just like Dr. Bockwald said at one point, it's truly a moral obligation for us as surgeons to, uh, to be able to take care of those patients. Now you can turn them away and say, you know, I don't do revisions, I do primary cases, but the numbers are going up and one way or another, you're gonna have to deal with those complications. Now, as fellows, you're gonna go in your practice, I would not recommend that you tackle like a gastrogastric fistula on your first day or take care of like a chronic ulcer or stricture. I would recommend that you don't do that. Um, obviously, a sleep conversion to bypass, you can argue, you know, if there's no hernia, I can just go across and make a pouch and do uh, a, a standard bypass. But there's some complicated cases out there, and you need to be very careful in terms of how to select your patients, at least early on. Eventually, after five or six years of, you know, building your practice and building your self confidence and having developing some uh, uh, experience with those cases, you're going to have to deal with those patients. And I'm hoping the fact that you're part of this like start program and obviously you're doing robotic uh, surgery and you're interested in that and you're learning different techniques, hopefully the robotic approach will help you overcome some of those challenges. Now, keep in mind that this is a paper I always like to share. This is a paper that was published out of the Clinical Issues Committee back in 2014 when Stacey Brethauer was the chair of the committee. And basically it was a systematic review on 
the operative bariatric surgery, mostly at revisions and conversions. And, and the reason that paper was published is because obviously it was published in 2014, but we started working on that even prior to that. And basically uh, there was a trend. We saw a national trend in the number of a division of procedures. So the clinical issues committee decided that, you know, we need to look into that and they published that paper. And I'm not going to go over the details of that paper, but basically what they said is that these long-term complications are happening. You know, our patients are suffering from weight gain over, over time and from some long-term complications. And as bariatric surgeons, we have to deal with those complications. And the interesting thing is that based on that systematic review, they also found that the um, incidence of post-op complications, obviously compared to primary cases, was higher. So now the question becomes, you know, we have those complications. Those complications or those issues are happening in addition to the issue of weight gain, obviously, which is a big issue. Um, we know that the numbers are going up. We know that the um, incidence of post-op complications uh, is higher just because of the technical challenges, um, you know, and I'm sure you've seen some of those cases and you know how complicated they are. Um, they can take up to four or five hours sometimes. So the question becomes, you know, robotic, is robotic surgery one of those like new innovative platforms that can help us potentially overcome some of those technical challenges? And if the answer is yes, does that translate into better outcomes? We don't have the answer, and I'll share some, some of our data, but I don't have a clear answer for you. But these are some of the questions that we're asking ourselves now as surgeons. You know, we have this like new, very fancy, innovative technology. Is that truly helping us overcome some of the technical challenges? In my experience, there's no question about that. But the data is all over the place, and I'll share some of those numbers with you. But at least uh, for somebody like me who's very invested, has been doing it for some time, we have a lot of experience. We're a high volume center doing mostly a robotic. Uh, you know, we believe that it does truly overcome some of those technical challenges, and it can potentially improve outcomes over time. Now, you also need to talk about access. We're always talking about access. You know, I used to get uh, uh, patients from uh, New York, New Jersey, Philadelphia. Uh, all these surrounding areas because some of the surgeons out there were not truly offering robotic surgery and were not able to do those complicated cases. So access is an issue. So the question becomes, if we implement that new technology, does that improve access? Uh, again, I don't have an answer, but something to keep in mind. And how can I safely implement robotic uh, assisted surgery in my practice? Again, I'm gonna show you some very complicated cases at the end of this lecture. I do not recommend that you jump and start doing those cases uh, on day one, but you know you need to develop a systematic approach uh, uh, to safely implement uh, uh, robotic surgery in your practice. Maybe start doing simple uh, primary cases, then over time, after you get past your learning curve, you can start tackling more uh, technically challenging uh, procedures. And this is something that we talked about during the hands-on uh, uh, course in uh, Atlanta. So something to keep in mind, it's a very stepwise or step up approach to uh, implementing the technology and using it in technically challenging cases. Now, we looked at our practice and the type of cases that we're dealing with. And this is a uh, was like a small project that one of my uh, uh, summer interns and medical student worked on. And basically, he went back and looked at all the revisions that were done in our practice and gave us like a list of all the uh, indications. And we published that paper. Uh, you know, um, a, we were very proud of him. He was very proactive and worked extremely hard on that paper. And basically, what we found is that, you know, we're seeing all kinds of complications. Weight gain, uh, for the most part, after a sleeve and bypass, we're seeing some sleeve uh, complications like hernias, valvulus, uh, migration, band complications, slippage, esophageal dilatation, pouch dilatation, issues like that. In addition to the bypass, uh, pretty well-known complications, stricture ulcers, and also some esophageal dysfunction. So the, this is kind of like an overview of some of the complications you're gonna to have to deal with. The one thing to keep in mind when you talk about robotic surgery, and if you have uh, any background in public health, you probably heard about that concept of learning health system. Uh, it's a virtual cycle of <coughs> collecting data, assembling your data, analyzing your data, interpreting the data, and then developing new guidelines and processes and maybe changing your surgical technique to improve outcome. This is something that 
as surgeons, uh, we need to work on, you know, collect our data, look at our outcomes. And then if there's any issue, we can go back and change our technique. If you have bleeding with a circular or linear stapler, maybe change it into a, a hands-on anosmosis. If you're doing the JJ in a certain way and you have a problem, maybe you look at other techniques. And you can use the same concept in what I call now robotic learning system. And Intuitive is basically a data company and they collect all that data on the back end and I think as surgeons who are doing robotic surgery, we need to use that data to our advantage. There's a lot of data that's being collected on your consult time, your movements, ergonomics, the type of instruments. So you can use that data to your advantage, you know, uh, interpret the data, modify your um, technique uh, to improve outcomes. So that's <laughs> something to keep in mind. Uh, now, when it comes to revisions, to focus on the topic of this lecture, <clears throat> you know, we looked at the MBS Equip uh, Registry, and we published that paper two years ago in the Journal of Robotic Surgery. And basically what we did, we took all the patients that were entered in MBS Equip between 2015 and 2017, and we did a propensity match, and we analyzed the patients and compared the outcome of laparoscopic robotic to robotic to uh, a, a laparoscopic revisions to robotic revisions. The idea was, you know, maybe uh, robotic, you know, we didn't see any uh, huge uh, difference in outcomes between uh, laparoscopic and robotic in primary cases. So we decided to look at revisions, thinking maybe in those technically uh, challenging cases, we can see a, uh, uh, a difference in outcomes. And basically, um, you know, I'm not going to spend too much time here on this paper, but basically, I'm not sure if you saw that paper, but there's a, a, a lower incidence of uh, adverse events, organ space infections, and reoperation, but the difference was not statistically significant. So we saw like a trend toward better outcomes, but that difference was not statistically significant. We also looked at uh, uh, readmission rate. Readmission rate, again, was um, uh, uh, different. It was actually higher in the robotic uh, cohort, 9% versus 6%. Uh, but again, that difference was not statistically significant. The one thing that was statistically significant, significant is the fact that <coughs> robotic was taking longer, which is pretty consistent across all study, uh, all, uh, all the uh, other studies looking at MBS equip. On, on average, robotic cases do take longer. So it's something to keep in mind. Now, our experience was pretty similar, but not, uh, not 100%. Uh, you know, we looked at our data and we figured maybe in our, in our experience, we'll see that difference because we are a high volume center. So we went back and looked at our own data, not MBS equipped, that's institutional data. And basically we compared 52 robotic revisions to almost like a hundred laparoscopic uh, revisions that were uh, done prior <coughs> to doing robotics. So these were not truly matched uh, uh, patients. <laughs> this was like a retrospective review. And again, we saw, we divided those into major complications and minor complications uh, based on the standardized outcome reporting that was published in SWORD. And basically what we found, again, a trend toward lower uh, a, 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 a lower incidence of complications, but that difference was not <coughs> statistically significant. So major complications was 5.2% for laparoscopic uh, group uh, versus 1.9%. <coughs> Very good. Any questions so far? We're going to go and start uh, talking about the uh, techniques, uh, uh, docking, port placement, and then we'll go um, uh, over some uh, videos. Maher, I'm going to jump in and ask a question because I thought your introduction was very really thought provoking and I loved it. Um, you mentioned that surgeons are looking for a new platform, a new way to approach three complicated cases that may not be easily performed laparoscopically. So increased complexity may emerge as an indication for robotic surgery, but also that's not the case you want to start with, right? So does that give a reason for surgeons to do the easier, the primary operations in a place where your hospital may give you a little bit of pushback because you don't, you want to have those skills refined. So when you, you want to tackle the complex cases, right, uh, you can do that. Can you elaborate a little bit on that? Yeah. I mean, I agree with you a hundred percent. I mean, if you ask me as a robotic surgeon, where do you see the true value? 
of robotic. Um, you know, we can talk about data, we can talk about the efficiency, we can talk about costs, uh, we can talk about ergonomics uh, for hours. There's no question about it, like it's better ergonomics. But the true value is not in simple cases, Adrian, because, <clears throat> you know, when you're talking about sleep gastrectomy that takes 20 and a half an hour uh, at most laparoscopically, and you have a leak rate less than 1%, it's extremely difficult to show that a robotic uh, a sleeve has better outcomes than laparoscopic sleeve. I mean, in my hands, I, I can argue that, you know, in very high BMI, thick abdominal wall, large hernias, um, tough sleeves, you know, they do better robotically. But overall, I cannot make that argument because, <coughs> sorry, I don't have that data to support that. But when it comes to complicated cases, there's no question about it. There's definitely, uh, uh, you know, uh, an improvement in the uh, technical aspect of the procedure. Outcomes is still out there. <clears throat> you know, the jury is still out on that, but uh, there's definitely uh, a, uh, uh, there's definitely value in those complicated cases. But for you to be able to do those cases, the complicated cases, again, and that's what you're trying to get to, you have to start uh, low. You start with the simple cases, the, the primary cases, maybe sleeves to get past your learning curve before you move on to doing more complicated cases. And this is how we train our fellows. This is how we proctor and train other surgeons, uh, you know, start with sleeve gastrectomy and then move on to more anastomotic procedures. Any other uh, comments, uh, questions? Don't be shy again. <laughs> Very good. So to go back to the, uh, um, you know, uh, port placement and docking, the, the other thing uh, that, you know, we work on, at least at our institution with the fellows, is consistency with the way we take care of our patients. Uh, so we've developed a technique where everything we do is very consistent, port placement, docking, even the instrument. And we did that to improve outcomes and to also improve efficiency. And we're actually in the process of collecting our efficiency data looking at OR time, consult time, uh, turnover time, and what we call wheels in, wheels out. And we found that with this standard, and the data is not published now, we're, we're in the process of uh, analyzing it, but there's a, a, a difference in terms of turnover and efficiency, OR, and I'm talking about OR efficiency, there's a, a, a difference in OR efficiency uh, uh, when we started doing robotic and now that we've standardized the, uh, the process and the technique. So what you're seeing here is my port placement, uh, and which is consistent across all cases, uh, sleeve bypasses, uh, SADES, uh, revisions, and even foregut procedures are done exactly the same way. If you remember, we talked about the two ways of uh, a placing ports. There's the left-handed approach where you, two, <coughs> you put two instruments in your left hand that's called the left-handed approach, two left-handed approach, and the right-handed approach where you put two instruments in your right hand. My approach is the two left-handed approach. It's the less common approach. Most surgeons use the uh, other approach where they put two instruments <coughs> in the right hand. But uh, in my case, the reason I like to do it this way, and I'll show you why in a second, because I like to have the stapler. The stapler uh, in our cases, uh, and bariatric procedure always comes from the right side. So uh, the thinking behind this is to actually bring your stapler from the right side and have another instrument in addition to the uh, stapler port to be able to help with dissection and retraction. So if you watch my videos, when I'm stapling stomach or small bowel, I have two hands in the abdomen. If you look at the other technique, the uh, two right-handed technique, where you have two instruments on the in your right hand on the left side of the patient, the minute you bring a stapler in, you're actually limited. So now you have a stapler and one instrument versus a stapler and two instrument. I'm gonna stop here and I'm gonna uh, ask you to uh, to reflect on that and uh, please let me know if you have any questions. It's a <laughs> you need to understand that difference between th those two techniques before we move on uh, to the uh, videos again. What you're looking at here, and this is basically that same port placement. We have two <coughs> instruments on the right side of the patient. So you have an eight port, 12 port. Uh, the third one is also an eight. That's the camera port, and that's very consistent. We don't hop. 
And then in my right hand, I have another eight. And then obviously the assistant port. And we'll talk about the assistant port in a second. But again, what you're seeing here is two left-handed instruments. So two ports on the right side of the patient, one port on the left side of the patient. So if you start by counting number one, number two, number three, and number four, okay? The second port is the stapling port. So it's an eight, 12, eight, and eight, two left-handed. So the minute I bring a stapler here, I still have two instruments in play, number one and number four, okay? <clears throat> if you have two instruments on the left side of the patient and only one port here for stapling, because for the most part, if you think about it, all bariatric surgeons staple from the right side. So you need to have a 12 on the right side. But if you have two instruments on the other side, the minute you bring the stapler here, you're very limited. And now you only have a stapler and one instrument. Now, if you're doing a sleeve, a primary sleeve, doesn't matter. It doesn't truly really matter. You can do a sleeve with three ports. So you don't even need four ports. But when it comes to complicated cases, again, and that's what we're talking about here, the divisions, conversions, these cases, you know, it's very helpful to have two, two hands in addition to the stapler. Does that make sense? Any questions about uh, port placement? Again, so we have an eight, 12 on the right side, two eights on the left side. My Nathanson is between number two and number three. And then I always have a, uh, a an assistant port on the a left side of the patient just because I dot from the right side. The assistant port uh, can help me if the fellow is doing case, I can uh, help uh, passing suture, if there's bleeding, I can help with suctioning and stuff like that. And this is how we dock. We dock from the right side and the Nathanson is basically on the left side. So uh, the final layout will look uh, something like that. I'm standing on the left side of the patient. We're docking from the right side of the patient. So I'm assisting my fellow, my fellow is sitting here doing the case. Now we have a teaching console. So now it looks a little bit different. Uh, but for the most part, if I'm not assisting uh, on the other console, uh, I'm uh, actually assisting by the bedside and I'm using that assistant port. And that's basically exactly how I do every single case. A sleeve, simple sleeve, uh, bypass, SADI, foregut, they're exactly done the same way with the same port placement. The only difference with the foregut, if you're not stapling, you don't need a 12, so it's eight, 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 eight. Uh, if you decide you wanna do a collis gastroplasty, maybe you have a short esophagus, you'll take that eight and put the 12. But for the most part, uh, it's two instruments on the right side, one on the left side, and an assistant port. And the fact that we're very consistent uh, in the way we uh, place our ports, the way we dock, and the way we approach those cases made things much, much, much easier. Obviously, for the fellows, they can learn that system from day one, and then we work on efficiency and technique for the whole year. They don't have to. It's not like, you know, you go and do a sleeve. This is how it's done. And then if I'm doing a bypass the second day, then port placement is different or instruments are different. It's exactly the same way. And I think this is one uh, thing to keep in mind uh, as uh, junior attendings, try to have your own way of doing things and be consistent and develop a system. Um, over time, you may change things, you may tweak things, but as long as you have a uh, process in place, you have a system in place and you're consistent in the way you do things, I think you'll be more efficient much quicker. What do you think, Adrian, talking about efficiency and consistency? You know, um, <clears throat> I, I was mentioning today to my residents that the most important um, three words in the vocabulary of the minimally invasive surgeon is economy of motion. And those of us who trained in the last 20 years in the early 2000s, you know, you, you, we would hear that over and over and over again, because at the time, some of the criticisms that we hear of robotics today were made of laparoscopy. And the way we overcame that is by being vigilant and, and obsessed with economy of motion and making it and developing the algorithms and the systems and the, and the, um, the repetition that made it, that made it um, so, um, so smooth and flawless in the way that we do laparoscopy today. So I think we can apply the same concept to robotics. So that's what I'm thinking when you say that, but I like what you're saying a lot. Very good. Um, saying that, let's start by showing videos. Uh, we're trying to make this very interactive. Do you guys have any questions or comments or feedback? I question. Uh, I saw your ahead. your your um, um, layout of your trocars. Where's your initial access to the abdomen? 
Yeah, that's a good question. Let me go back. Yeah, so basically what I do, I make an incision to start. And uh, this is how I used to do my laparoscopic cases, by the way. I'll make an incision off the midline, six to eight inches from the xiphoid. So it's like maybe 15 centimeter. Um, mm -hmm. And I go in with the varus. And then after that, I do OptiView with an eight. So this is my first port. And then I do my tap block. And then I put those on this side. And then after that, um, the fellow will do those on the other side. So I start on this side, I put these two ports, and then the fellow will do the other uh, two ports on the other side. And then we put the patient in reverse teeth. We put the Nathanson in. If we're doing a sleep, we dock and go. If we're doing a uh, bypass, we put the Nathanson, put the patient back supine. We dock supine, do the JJ supine, and then uh, put the patient in diversity and do the gastro J because I don't do the omega loop. I do JJ first and then gastro J. So I put my Nathanson and then put the patient in supine, do my JJ, and then do the gastro J. But I always go in uh, a little bit off the midline. Obviously, if I have somebody... Uh, <clears throat> who had a midline scar or like previous X lap or something, uh, you know, I may go uh, on the sides, uh, put the varus maybe in polymerase point and then um, go with one of those ports. But typically, uh, uh, if I'm not concerned about small bowel adhesions or anything like that, I'll just go off, off the midline. And then everything is basically, that's my reference point. So I don't truly do it that much measurements except for the first one, six to eight inches. And sometimes I cheat up or cheat down depending on the body habitus. You know, sometimes the umbilicus is too low or too high. If the patient uh, has like a lax abdominal wall and I feel like I'm going to get that kind of like big dome, I may cheat down so that I won't be sitting on top of the dome. But that's for the most part, that's my reference point. And then everything is basically uh, uh, placed around that. You know, I go all the way, you know, talking about these two ports, I go all the way uh, to the right flank. I put this port and then I split that difference and put the... Uh, uh, a stapling port, the 12 port. And I do the same thing on the other side. I put the assistant port all the way kind of like left flank, maybe anterior axillary line, just behind the, uh, um, you know, above the colon. And then I split that difference and put my number four. Any other questions about port placement docking, um, you know, two left-handed versus uh, two right-handed uh, um, you know, approach. I was talking to one of the fellows during the hands-on and I was, I was, I think showing, uh, showing them how uh, I do it. Uh, and it was kind of like a little bit different than what uh, they're used to. But the minute we started the dissection and brought the stapler, it made sense. I have a question about, oh. You go ahead. I, I just have a question about the assist port. Um, mm -hmm. uh, in our practice, uh, we've been, we place it uh, just to the right of the umbilicus. Do you find that it ever has any interaction being so far on the left or it's really easy to pass things in and out of and for a person to assist from? So let me go back to, uh, so you're saying, are you, uh, you, you place the assist port down here, right? Yes, uh, okay, on, so on, the, on the right side of the On the, the right side, so down here. And mm -hmm, that's, mm -hmm. yeah, and I've seen many people do that and that's okay. The only, the only issue uh, using this like two left-handed instrument the assistant port will be colliding with the instruments. Uh, and uh, so that's going to be an issue. And you may not be able to reach, like if you're suctioning or you may not be able to reach all the way up if you're starting from down below, unless you're using it just for suture passing. <coughs> but the thing is, is I think the assistant port um, is kind of like out of the way. So if I don't need it, I don't even see it. And I don't have to deal with that. And if I need help with suctioning and stuff, it's coming from the side. Uh, so from a logistic standpoint, logistically, it makes more sense for me to put my port on the other side where I don't have to uh, deal with that. Maher, with regards to camera hopping, <clears throat> is it completely discouraged just to mention to be condemned in your practice? Or do you once in a while do it? I find it useful sometimes. It depends what part of the, yeah. if I'm working in the, you know, on the right cruise through the pars flasta versus if I'm working uh, by, by the spleen, I find it beneficial to um, to hop camera. Yeah, I mean, it's not, there's nothing wrong with like camera hopping. It's actually one of the advantages of the robot. Uh, so if you feel like you need to do that, by all means, please do that. 
the, the issue I, or the comment I was trying to make is that I try not to do that to, uh, to be more efficient. I try not to do uh, uh, too many instrument exchanges. I try not to actually uh, go in and out uh, because, you know, like those robotic cases can take a long time. And if you don't pay attention to those like uh, minor things, it will make a huge, I mean, a two hour case can turn into a four hour case. So even if I'm doing a bypass, if you're watching, uh, you know, me doing JJ, I'm using two instruments and like uh, that's a, uh, a, the a 12 port is just for stapling. So you see the stapler coming in, you staple, you come out, come in, staple and come out. So I try to limit the number of instrument exchanges as much as I can, obviously, uh, just to be more efficient and try not to hop. Uh, I mean, can you do that? Of course. Should you do that if you if you feel like you need to, uh, because you have poor exposure or if you're not seeing very well, then obviously um, you should do that. But again, uh, as long as you have a system in place and you're consistent in the way you do things, um, you'll be fine. Like uh, you know, efficiency obviously is an issue. We talked about cost. You know, um, you know, for the most part, all all the studies, including ours, have shown that the uh, OR time with the robotic case is longer than laparoscopic case. So anything we can do to actually uh, a, try to bridge that gap and lower cost. So saying that, uh, this is, uh, let's start by uh, seeing some of those cases. We'll go over that. Again, this is the same approach that we talked about. Uh, this is a patient who came in with uh, um, um, a status post open VBG. He had a uh, <coughs> chronic nausea and vomiting and a, uh, gastrogastric, uh, um, um, a small fistula. Um, we basically, uh, you know, took the patient uh, for a uh, conversion from a VBG to a bypass uh, fistula takedown. And what you're seeing here is uh, uh, creation of the gastric pouch. So uh, we try uh, in a case like that, if there's no evidence of band erosion, this patient did not have any evidence of band erosion. Uh, we uh, did not um, try to uh, take the band out. We're trying to staple and make a pouch above the band and then do the bypass. Um, and what you see in here is the first uh, staple line. And now we're trying to uh, open that retrogastric uh, space uh, to uh, staple and make, the, uh, make that pouch. Obviously, we spend like half an hour, 45 minutes to start dissecting the left lobe of the liver off the... Off the uh, uh, of the uh, uh, pouch. Uh, and then what we're trying to do here is to uh, uh, create a new pouch. And you can see that, uh, you know, uh, we had a, a gastrotomy uh, at the at the tip of the uh, staple line. Uh, so uh, we decided to mobilize a little bit more and reshape that pouch uh, with a new stapler and exclude that part where there was a big uh, gastrotomy. And this is just to, um, you know, um, I don't want to just show you like simple, easy cases. I want to show you complicated cases where, um, you know, uh, there's technical issues, technical challenges. And this is, I think, where the, uh, uh, you know, 3D visualization, the fact that you have three instruments, you have a better reach and a uh, uh, easier, way, easier way for stapling the pouch makes a huge difference in a tough case like that. So, and we decided that given that big gastrotomy, I'm just gonna, um, you know, uh, resect that so that I don't have to deal with that. And then what I will do, I'll uh, bring a, a, a limb, uh, uh, a, a rule in and uh, do a gastro J. So that's the JJ. Uh, so basically the way we do the JJ is very similar to the way we used to do it laparoscopically. Um, you know, um, we staple, it's a functional end-to-end -end ge jejunal jejunostomy. Basically what we're doing, we're stapling the uh, anastomosis and then we're hand sewing the uh, common enterotomy. And then we bring a uh, rule in uh, and then we're doing a double layer hand sewn anastomosis, which is very consistent the way we do it. Uh, even the SADI, I do it exact, do you know ileostomy? I do the SADI exactly the same way. Uh, and uh, believe it or not, this part of the procedure is usually the first part that the fellow works on. You know, we work on stapling, on dissecting and stapling uh, the pouch in a gastric sleeve. And then we have them imbricate the uh, staple line to make sure they're uh, comfortable suturing. And after we're done with that part, uh, they move on and uh, do the gastro first and the bypass before they do the JJ or they do the pouch. 
And again, what I'm trying to show you here is another issue that we had. We had that gastrotomy, tissue was very uh, friable and edematous and it fell apart. And then uh, even with the uh, hands on and osmosis, we ended up, that whole thing fell apart. So we had to decide, do we do it again? Uh, do you do, do a, use a small circular stapler or maybe do an esophageal jejunostomy? Because I did not truly have that much pouch left to be able to do my gastro J. Uh, so basically what I decided is to take the entire anterior row and then I read it the whole thing with bigger bites um, using uh, a different suture. And then, uh, you know, it, it worked fine and the patient did very good. But uh, at one point we were thinking uh, if this doesn't work and we end up with the same issue and the uh, gastric tissue continues to be very friable and edematous and we're not able to do a, uh, a safe anosmosis um, I'm going to have to sack the entire pouch and staple above the left gastric and do an esophageal J. Basically, what we did here, what you saw at the beginning of the video, we stapled, uh, you know, proximal to the band to exclude that band completely, but distal to the left gastric bundle to preserve blood supply to the gastric pouch. Uh, now, if you don't have enough pouch, uh, or maybe you have a fistula that's too high, uh, and you need to exclude that fistula, sometimes you have to staple above the left gastric bundle. If you staple above the left gastric bundle and you are losing, you lose supply to the entire gastric pouch, then you're committed and you have to do an esophageal J. Luckily, I was very close to doing an esophageal J, but uh, with the second attempt, it went, it went pretty well and we we're able to do a, uh, uh, a, a safe anastomosis hands-on. And then what I'm doing here is imbricating that staple line. Typically, I don't imbricate the staple line if I'm doing a bypass, but if I'm doing a revision, and that's something I've learned over time, and it's kind of like it's becoming a, uh, a habit, I don't leave any staple lines uncovered. Even if the staple line looks very hemostatic and well-formed, I'm always very um, conscientious of that fact that, you know, in a revision, if anything's going to go wrong, it'll be a staple line issue, either bleeding or leak or breakdown. So I don't typically leave any staple line, uh, um, you know, um, uh, not pre-enforced in a revision. So I usually imbricate the staple line and cover all my staple lines. Maher, can you describe your anastomosis there? So you did an inner layer of Vicro running a circumferential, correct? Yeah. So I, so the outer layer is usually 2 VLOC. So I start by, uh, with the outer layer 2 VLOC, um, mm -hmm. And that takes the tension off. And then I make the gastrotomy and thyrotomy. And then I start at nine o'clock using a nine inch uh, to a vital. I go around, you know, in out on the pouch, out in, out in on the bowel. And I go around the anastomosis. And then I start another one with a shorter, uh, shorter uh, length, seven inch, uh, again, at, uh, at three o'clock, out and on the pouch, in out on the bowel. And I tie it in the middle over a bougie. Okay. And that's typically how I do my uh, uh, gastro J, duodenal um, any kind of like uh, uh, anastomosis, uh, two layer hands on anastomosis. With the SADI, sometimes if you don't have enough, uh, you know, uh, a bowel, uh, uh, bowel length, you may end up doing just like the inner layer and I skip the outer layer if I don't have enough. Um, you know, do a dinner cough to be, uh, to be able to do the second layer. But for the most part, it's a 2 of VLOC on the outer layer and 2 of, um, a 2 of vital on the inner layer. Thank you. Uh, so that's for a, that's for that. Let's move on. This is a uh, something that I see. It's uh, obviously it's not something that you see every single day, but in my practice, it's kind of like, you know, it's a bread and butter uh, division, I call it. It's a perforated ulcer, it's a stricture. This patient had a gastric bypass uh, that perforated anteriorly, uh, and it was a big ulcer. And now what, you, what you're seeing here is basically dissecting the anastomosis off the undersurface of the left lobe of the liver. Uh, and then there's, you'll see a big hole here. And typically what I do, uh, uh, what I do for those cases, uh, my algorithm depends on the patient presentation and the patient history. So typically if I'm dealing with a smoker or maybe a history of uh, you know, uh, ulceration because of NSAID use or something like that, I'll take it down and redo the whole anastomosis without doing a vagotomy. If I have somebody who does not have a big pouch to explain the ulcer, is not a smoker, is not taking NSAID, um, then typically what I would do, I would do a vagotomy in addition 
uh, to uh, revising the anastomosis. Uh, we did one uh, this past week and patient was a chronic smoker and she had a large uh, ulcer. So I revised the entire anastomosis, but I didn't do a vagotomy because I felt like, you know, I have an explanation of why the patient had an ulcer. But if I don't have a big pouch, this patient, you'll see here that she had a, uh, a big pouch. So I'm going to trim that pouch a little bit because that can explain why the patient has a chronic ulcer. But again, if I have somebody who does not have a big pouch, uh, is not a smoker, is not a chronic NSAID uh, user, um, uh, when I advise those, I tend to do a vagotomy. I don't have any data to support uh, doing a, uh, a vagotomy. Uh, on those patients. I think this this uh, maybe is one of those patients. Maybe I'm doing a vagotomy here. So yeah, so in those patients, I'll do I'll do a vagotomy to help prevent the uh, 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 recurrence of the ulcer. So what you'll see here, me uh, uh, looking at the uh, right vagus, and then after I do that, I'll, I'll, I'll turn my attention and do the uh, uh, left vagus as well. And then what we're doing here, trying to dissect the omentum off the pouch. And then we'll staple again, typically what I would do in a case like that, I'll staple the bowel and use that as a handle. And that will help you also find that demarcation between the uh, small bowel and the pouch. Sometimes you can see where the anastomosis is. You can see it, you can see where the stomach ends, where the small bowel starts, but sometimes the whole thing is a big like phlegmon and it's hard to see the, uh, a, um, the difference between the pouch and the bowel. Uh, so just stapling the bowel and using that as a handle, um, it will demarcate uh, the uh, anatomical uh, planes for you. And then you see where the pouch is and where the anastomosis is. And then what I would do after that, after stapling the bowel, I'll staple and after dissecting the, uh, the ulcer, I'll staple the pouch proximal to the ulcer to completely exclude the ulcer. So you're basically like resecting the whole a uh, piece of the bowel, piece of the stomach and the ulcer on block. And you take that out. And then now you have a fresh uh, tissue with good blood supply because you're preserving the left gastric bundle. And then you reconstruct your anastomosis just like you're doing a, a, a new bypass. Any questions about, uh, I'm sure you guys have seen like chronic ulcers like that, uh, chronic strictures. So what, what you saw us do here, and again, let me see. So that's the right vagus here. Yeah. So the vagotomy is actually an easy part of the procedure. If you if you get into the right plane, the right vagus uh, is uh, very easy to find. I've seen many cases where there is actually, uh, it's not supposed to split uh, by the EGJ, but I've seen cases where there's actually two large bundles by the EGJ. Typically it splits much higher than that, but uh, I've seen cases uh, where, you know, there's two, uh, uh, two branches. So pay attention to that. Uh, the left vagus um, is not usually uh, adherent to the esophagus like that. So sometimes it's harder to find. And I typically uh, will take at least maybe a uh, maybe three or four centimeter of the vagus and send it to pathology for confirmation. But, um, you know, I've never sent one thinking it's vagus and, uh, you know, it turned out that it's not vagus. Usually you can see it, you can feel it. Uh, and um, and like I said here with the stapler, what I'm doing here, I'm using a green because the tissue is very thick and I'm stapling proximal to that big opening, that ulcer, but I'm preserving blood supply because I'm stapling below the left gastric bundle. So the supply to your pouch is the left gastric bundle. And, and the, other, the other comment I would make uh, over here, and this is what I was talking about earlier today. If you watch those videos, I'm stapling the bowel, I'm stapling the pouch, but I'm, I still have two hands. I have a cardia in my left hand. I have a uh, scissors in my right hand. I'm, 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 I'm moving the tissue uh, right and left. I'm uh, manipulating the tissue, helping with traction, counter-traction. So I have full control of that case. Uh, I'm not, by, by stapling, while I'm stapling, I'm not losing my other hand. 
if you, uh, that's the beauty of the two left-handed uh, technique. If you are using a two right-handed technique, the minute you start stapling, then you're basically using a stapler in your left hand and another instrument in your right hand, which is fine. You know, if you can do it that way, it's fine. I usually like to uh, have two hands to manipulate the tissue while I'm stapling. So uh, uh, Adrian, this is now I'm reconstructing that anosmosis. So again, I'm, I'm doing using two of VLOC um, to uh, bring that bowel up to the pouch. So that's my outer layer, two of, two of VLOC. And the beauty here, nobody has to hold it for you. It's holding tension, it takes the tension off the anosmosis. Typically when I'm, a, I'm not sure if you noticed that, typically when I staple the pouch, if I'm doing a primary bypass, my uh, first staple line is the outer layer of my anastomosis. I go around the staple line. Over here, the pouch looked like a little bit like, it looked like a Mickey Mouse head. So I had to re, like, I had to position the pouch and change it in a way where I have enough tissue to be able to reconstruct the pouch. So I didn't use that first staple line to make my anastomosis. I sutured the uh, bowel to the pouch and then I made my gastronomy. Maher, I'm going to ask a question here because in transitioning to robotics and the hand-sewn anastomosis, the hardest thing for me is to, to incise the bowel and the pouch like you are doing right now. Mm -hmm. uh, I know my fellow's on the call here and she's probably nodding like just how nervous I get when I do that. What is your energy on? How much coag and how four, much? It's four and four and I'm using coags. And you use the coag, okay? Coag, yeah. And I had the same issue, uh, Adrian. I know exactly where you're coming from because I had the same issue uh, when I transitioned because we used to use the harmonic. It was like a nice clean cut and it yeah. was very hemostatic. Uh, so with the uh, with the robot, it's a little bit different. And uh, so it took me some time to find a way to make it happen without getting too much bleeding or too much, um, you know, uh, escar on the stomach and the bowel and basically what i usually tell the fellow i'm not sure if my fellow is on the call or not but i usually say use four you you burn and then you you put some tension you burn and you cut so you push burn cut push burn cut and when you burn i burn for two seconds so i push against the tissue burn i say one two cut one two cut and the reason i do that is because i've noticed if you burn too much without cutting all you get is escar or you get this ASCAR and then you have problem getting a nice anosmosis. If you cut before you burn those like two seconds on four, this, this is, those are my numbers, then uh, you get some bleeding, uh, you know? So uh, it is uh, pressure. And what you saw me here is making the gastronomy against the bougie. I have the bougie in place. That helps me a lot, especially when I have thick tissue, like a pouch like that. So I bring that bougie against the gastric wall from the inside and I burn over that bougie. Uh, and I use my scissors. Uh, some people use it, uh, use a hook, but I find that with the scissor, I have a cleaner gastrotomy and cleaner enterotomy. So I put some tension on the, on the tissue, burn one, two seconds and cut. And the setting, like I said, is four and four. Yeah. And then Maher, so my, my settings are pretty similar, six and four. And I've found some success with that. Um, the other thing I want to ask you is, you know, Clearly, we see fewer strictures on the GJs with the hand sewn. Um, but how how big do you make your your anastomosis? The other pearl that I want to make sure the the fellows know, at least from my standpoint, I try to make the the small bowel a little bit smaller because it tends to stretch out. Yes, yes, I do exactly. You're exactly right, uh, Adrian. The small bowel I tend to make it a little bit smaller because they tend to stretch. And if you make it, if you match it completely, you end up you end up with a bigger like enterotomy. So I do exactly the same. I make the small bowel I cheat a little bit because it, you can always stretch it if you have to. But uh, basically, what I do, I do the anastomosis over a 36 French bougie. So I do my outer layer, I do my inner layer, and then before I tie my inner layer. I'll slide the 36 French bougie and tie it over the bougie. And then I keep the bougie in place. And then I do my outer layer uh, with the 2 OV lock while the bougie is in place. Yeah. So one of my junior partners, as we were doing our outer layer, got a, got a little overzealous with a barbed suture. And let me tell you, those barbs work. 
it will yeah, personally right. get shot. Yeah. So and I always get that's a very good point. And I always get the question: Why do you do the outer layer with two of lock and you do the inner layer with the two of vital? Two, mm -hmm. two, two answers. First, it's exactly what you were saying. The inner layer, if you make a mistake and you pull too hard, it will cinch the anastomosis. So if the fellow is doing it, they're not getting that tactile feedback and they're pulling too hard, it can cinch the anastomosis very easily. The outer layer, I'm doing it over a bougie. They can pull as much as they want. It doesn't matter because I have a bougie in place. So the two of Vicro is more forgiving and you have a lower chance of like cinching it and kind of like uh, making it too tight. The outer layer, you can use a tool of, a tool of v lock because you're doing it over a bushy. So we have a few more minutes. Let me uh, move on to, this is another, um, uh, this is a very interesting case. So this is a guy who had band conversion to sleeve. So they took the band out, they did a sleeve. The guy didn't lose that much weight uh, and then came back and I said, okay, we'll do a sleeve conversion to bypass. When I took him back uh, to do that sleeve conversion to bypass, I found that the fundus is huge and the pseudo capsule was not truly excised. So basically, you know, whoever did the band conversion to sleeve, you know, did the sleeve, but did not truly excise that pseudo capsule and did not truly mobilize the fundus the way they're supposed to before doing that band conversion to sleeve. And, you know, I was giving a lecture last time and I showed two separate videos. I showed a video of me doing a pseudo capsule excision and conversion from band to sleeve laparoscopically. And then I showed the same video uh, doing it robotically. And I was trying to show the difference in visualization, economy of movement, the ease of dissection, and the fact that robotically I was able to do a better job. You know, I knew what needed to be done and I knew I had to excise that pseudo capsule. And I usually spend more time excising that pseudo capsule than the rest of the case, because I like to truly skeletonize that. And you'll see that in the video in a second. I, I always open the hiatus. I take that pseudo capsule. I wanna see the EGJ, I wanna see the esophagus. I, I truly spend a lot of time dissecting to make sure that I'm mobilizing the fundus and I'm fixing any hernia if there's any hernia and I'm taking the entire pseudo capsule before I do my sleeve or my bypass. I think that, if you don't do that, you end up with a large fundus and poor weight loss. And I, I think some of the poor data that we saw out there with band conversion to sleeve has to do with the fact that I don't think we're doing a very good job dissecting that pseudo capsule and truly mobilizing that pouch as evidenced by this case here. So what you're seeing me here, instead of just jumping and doing that sleeve conversion to bypass, I'm actually doing what, what was supposed to be done in the first place, dissecting that pseudo capsule, fixing that hernia, mobilizing the fundus, and then doing the bypass. So um, what you're seeing me here is, uh, you know, fixing a hernia repair. I'm taking that hernia sac. I'm dissecting that pseudo capsule. And then now I'm opening uh, the pars flaccida to make my pouch. And that's when, 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 when the robot truly shines, you have better visualization, you have better instruments, you can see better, you can do better, and you can take your time doing what uh, what we're supposed to be doing in the first place. And you can see here, I'm, di I'm resecting that fundus, which was supposed to be resected when he had that band conversion to sleep. Now, I can't say for sure that that basically was the reason why he didn't lose any weight, but it just makes me think that, you know, I think now with the robot, we're approaching those cases robotically. I think, at least in my case, we're doing a better job uh, you know, uh, doing those complicated cases. And again, uh, you know, took everything down, fixed the hernia, used the mesh, resected that fundus, and now I'm reconstructing uh, that pouch. And, and, and that's basically the easy part of the procedure. You know, what you saw initially is two of VLOC, and now we're doing the uh, inner layer with, with two of Vicryl, in, out, out, and on the pouch. You go around the corner, and then you start one from the other side, and you tie it over a bougie. And the beauty of this technique, I'm not sure, Adrian, whether you do hands-on or uh, linear stapler, but I always say, you know, the anastomosis always looks very pretty at the end. Even if you're dealing with very inflamed, very adenitis tissue, ugly case, at the end of the case, the anastomosis always looks very consistent and very pretty, which makes me happy. Yeah, I do exactly what you do, uh, Maher. I do uh, the, exactly the same technique for um, DI or GJ. And I do inner layer with um, with a um, 
four of vic with a three of vicron out or later okay. with three o a barb suture. But I do tie two vicrols together to make it a two ended suture. So I start in the back and bring them around from both sides. That's okay. Not- okay. And what you see in here, I'm also like I said, in those cases, I always uh, you know imbricate, reinforce the staple lines. So even though the staple line on the pouch looked nice and hemostatic and well formed. I decided I want to imbricate that step line so that I don't take any chances. And you know, y- y- that, that kind of approach has changed the way we, we do things. So now, even with like a two or three hour case like that, um, you know, uh, no drains, no upper GIs, unless the patient has a large hernia, I'm looking uh, to have a, an X-ray as a baseline. Uh, but in a case like that, they start liquid diet like a few hours later and they go home the day after, just like a primary bypass. All right, saying that, I'm going to stop, open it for discussion. I think we uh, we have maybe a few more minutes. Of course, it's 8 o'clock, but let's let's make sure everybody gets their questions answered and, and we, we discuss this. It's too important not to. Dr. Alshar, do you uh, routinely use a staple line reinforcer for your GJ or for these revisional cases? No, it's it's a it's a very good question. Uh, we're actually in the process of looking at uh, the MBS equip data to see if there's a uh, a difference in outcome between staple line reinforcement and no staple line reinforcement. And if you ask me, uh, does the staple line reinforcement make a difference? The simple answer is I don't know because we don't have that data. We actually published a data. I'm not sure if you saw that back in 2018 in JAX. Uh, basically, what we did in that paper, we looked at MBS equip data and we looked at four different categories: uh, staple line reinforcement no oversewing, uh, staple line reinforcement plus oversewing, uh, no staple line reinforcement, no oversewing, and both. So we looked at all four different categories and we found, uh, which was pretty similar to what other authors have found, that the staple line reinforcement helps with bleeding, right? There's no difference and there was no leak rate back then. Now, now we're collecting leak rate in MBS Equip, but back then when we published that data, that paper based on MBS Equip, there's nothing called leak in the MBS Equip data. It was organ space infection. So we use that organ space infection as a reflection of the leak rate. But nonetheless, we didn't find any difference in leak rate or organ space infection. We found the difference in bleeding rate. So basically what we said, staple line reinforcement can help with bleeding and over sewing can help with bleeding. Now, keep in mind that that data was based on Ethicon stapler and a Medtronic stapler. You know, back then, we're not doing bypasses robotically. At least there was no robotic bypasses in the MBS equip data. If you ask me now the same question, when it comes to robotic uh, cases, the answer is, I don't know. I don't know because we don't have that data. And that's why we're looking into that data at this point. Basically, what we're doing, we're taking MBS equip uh, uh, numbers from 2019 and we're separating uh, patients into robotic and laparoscopic, and we're just looking at the robotic cases. Obviously, some of the limitations that we don't know if those robotic cases were done with a short form stapler or a robotic stapler or a different stapler, but nonetheless, we're looking at the issue of staple line reinforcement just with robotic uh, uh, cases, just to be able to answer your question. Now, believe it or not, and I'm not sure, Adrian, I'm not sure if you know that, Starting 2020, actually, MBS Equip stopped collecting data on the staple line reinforcement. So now, so now if you ask your abstractor, before 2020, <coughs> they were supposed to put that data in MBS Equip. So if you're using like SceneGuard or other kind of staple line reinforcement, they have to put that in uh, MBS Equip ACS database. As of 2020, that data uh, is not being collected. So... So we had to limit our analysis to the 2019 MBS Equip database, and hopefully we'll have an answer for you. But um, so to answer your question, I don't know if it makes a difference in the outcome or not. And my practice on sleeve, I don't use staple line reinforcement, not because I don't like it, just because I want the fellow to practice like suturing. On the bypass, I only use it on the first fire because I use a parse flaccid technique. So I'm crossing that pouch, I'm crossing those like, small vessels along the lesser curve, and that can cause some bleeding. So I use one seam guard, and then I finish stapling without seam guard. Does Maher, that answer your question? Yeah, Maher, we have a question from uh, Dr. Kevin Brown, who's watching on YouTube. Uh, he wants to know um, why you use mesh at the hiatus. There was a video that showed some mesh there. 
And is that something they use routinely or all the time? Yeah, I mean, in those cases, uh, yes and no. I mean, um, you know, a, uh, I used to use it like routinely. Now it, dep it depends on the case. If I feel like it's a it's a tough case, it's a large uh, it's a large hernia. Um, you know, I, I may use a, uh, a biologic mesh. Uh, uh, this is a, uh, a synthetic uh, absorbable mesh. It's a bio A mesh uh, made of polyglycolic acid and trimethyl carbonate (PGA and TMC). Um, and a, uh, it gets absorbed within like 90 days or so. And I think it helps with uh, recurrence, at least like in the short term. Long term, you know, obviously the data is out there. Uh, there's no difference in uh, recurrence rate like uh, uh, long term, but uh, at least short term, it does help with uh, recurrence. Yeah, I personally use it, especially if I repaired a hernia there before. Yeah. And I don't ever want to be back after a revision. A um, couple of things, Maher, you know, the visualization is tremendous. The ability to use Firefly to delineate between the liver and bowel when it's all stuck together. Um, those are really nice uh, features, the robot. And when I do a, even a primary sleeve, some of the planes that you see back there um, that you can release that fundus, make sure you've got the whole fundus out. Those are things that I typically used to not see laparoscopically. Can you comment on that a little bit? Yeah, I mean, you know, you're talking, Adrian, and I'm thinking about the case I did earlier today. <clears throat> there was a uh, patient who had a hernia repair and links and then developed this like, you know, horrendous dysphagia, uh, even though the links, um, uh, you know, appeared to be in good position. You know, we tried to dilate him once or twice endoscopically and did nothing. Young, healthy guy, and I felt bad. I was like, you know what, enough is enough. I'm going to take that links out. I went in this morning with my fellow to take the links. It was like, like a bomb went off, you know, it's, there are a lot of inflammation. I was, I was concerned about like erosion when I went in and so, and it was stuck to the esophagus, stuck to the pouch. So I had to actually mobilize the pouch, uh, mobilize the, the stomach and, and go behind the stomach to get that left curse and go behind the esophagus to be able to, you know, fish those beads one by one. And I'm, I'm doing it and I'm thinking there's no way I can do that laparoscopically. Like there's no way on earth I can get behind the esophagus and see that clearly laparoscopically. So, you know, there's no question about it. When it comes to those complicated cases, um, you know, the visualization, the reach and the, uh, uh, you know, veracity of those instruments that we're using and the and the wristed instruments makes, it makes a huge difference. There's no question about it. Now, you know, again, to go back to the value add, the concept of value add, you know, you always want to bring value to your, uh, to your practice. You want to have an impact on your patient outcomes. You know, does it truly make a huge difference if you're doing a simple sleeve, a primary sleeve? The answer is probably not because, you know, laparoscopically, you can do a sleeve, simple sleeve and a BMI of 35, 30, 34. You can do those patients, you know, in an outpatient center in 20 minutes, patients go home the same day. There's no issue about that. But when it comes to very complicated cases like that, you know, having, like you're saying, that 3D visualization, the third hand, uh, you know, the reach, uh, those wristed instruments make a huge difference. What other questions uh, do we have with the group? Dr. Alchar, do you uh, notice um, in your practice, do you notice any utility in, in prophylactically putting a mental patch on your anastomosis in these revision cases? Yeah, it's a, it's a very good question. I used to do that routinely when I was doing the bypass laparoscopically. I used to do that routinely. And now, I don't know, maybe I'm getting older. I have more confidence. I, I don't do that anymore. Uh, I feel like this is pretty safe anastomosis. It's a uh, two-layer hands-on anastomosis. I do a bubble test like you saw in trap endoscopy. Uh, but, you know, I, I like that grant patch. The, uh, you know, this is, uh, you know, the shower cap, you know, uh, um, they call it. Uh, we used to do that uh, back in the uh, back at the Carolinas when I was a fellow, even before it was called shower cap. And it made sense because if you have a leak or perforation, basically what you do, you take that patient back and you do a grand patch, right? So that um, it, it always made sense to me as a fellow and even as an attending. And for more than seven, eight years, I was doing that on every single laparoscopic bypass I was doing. But now I stopped doing that. Adrian, do you do that? You do that uh, shower cap? 
I don't. I remember <laughs> us joking about the name Shower Cap during my fellowship with Phil Shower. <laughs> so, you know, we, we called it a shower curtain sometimes. But yeah. Um, but yeah, it makes sense. I don't use it. You know, again, you'd be doing a lot of extra work for problems that would be so um, so few and far between. However, I could see for a difficult revision how you'd want anything you could possibly use to your advantage. Yeah. The one thing I would say, though, uh, from a kind of like a pitfall, if you decide to do a shower cap and you a pulling on the momentum, make sure the momentum is free before you pull the momentum and cover the uh, anastomosis, because sometimes if it's stuck to the spleen, you can cause the splenic laceration. I've seen that. I've done it myself. So be very careful. Even like a small, simple, stupid thing like that can get you in trouble. If you're pulling too hard on it, especially if you're doing it probiotically and you don't get that you know, what we call tactile or force feedback, and it's stuck to the spleen, you can easily injure the uh, splenic capsule. Very good. I think, you know, for the sake of time, Adrian, if there's no other questions, maybe we can stop here. Yeah, that sounds good. You know, just one other thing I want to mention, sometimes the hand-sewn technique, and please comment on this, Maher, also, the hand-sewn technique allows you to do stuff that um, you may not be able to do with a linear stapler. For example, um, you know, with a linear stapler, you need a much larger landing zone on a difficult revision or even on a SADI, yeah. more duodenal dissection too. So to have that that comfort level with, with that anastomosis and to be able to do it in such a way that you don't need to get a stapler in there, you, it's not yeah, even just... I mean, I can't, yeah. I mean, I agree with you 100%. I mean, we didn't get the chance to talk about hands-on versus linear stapler, but you know, a linear stapler is an okay technique. And, you know, if you talk to some of the surgeons out there doing linear stapler gastro J, you know, they're doing great and they have good outcomes. Uh, you know, obviously there's the issue of bleeding. You have to keep that in mind, you know, uh, whether you're doing it laparoscopically or robotically, if you have a, a staple line, then the staple line can cause bleeding. So bleeding you have to deal with, right? The hands-on anastomosis, there's less bleeding. Uh, that's not me saying that. There's a lot of studies out there comparing circular stapler to linear stapler to uh, hands-on anastomosis. There's, uh, like uh, Adrian said, lower stricture rate with the hands-on and the linear stapler compared to the circular stapler. And there's definitely a lower bleeding rate with the hands-on compared to the linear and circular stapler. So you have to keep that in mind. But the other thing in terms of linear versus hands-on is that linear stapler is good until it's not good. And it's easy until it's not easy, because if you have like a case like the one I just showed you, the VBG conversion to a gastric bypass, good luck getting a linear stapler in that pouch. I mean, you don't even have a pouch to put a stapler in. So if you can't do a hands-on anastomosis in a case like that, you're stuck. So what I usually tell the fellow, at least learn how to do a hands-on anastomosis, right? If you want to use a linear stapler on an easy case, that's okay. You can fire the stapler and then you can uh, hand sew the uh, common enterotomy. But you need to learn how to do a hands on anastomosis. Uh, you know, it was not something that was easily, uh, you know, uh, teachable laparoscopically because sometimes, you know, uh, you know, patients are super obese, BMI 50 or 60, they have thick abdominal wall, they have big torso, and you have a lot of torque, and it's extremely difficult to do the hands on anastomosis. But on the robot, it's actually one of the easiest things you can do. It's, and I'm not just saying that, you know, this is how we train our fellows. When they start doing bypasses, the first, and you can talk to my fellows, they will tell you, the first thing they do on the bypass is a hands-on anastomosis, is a gastro J. I actually trust them to do the gastro J before dissecting the pouch or doing the JJ. Just because like Dr. Dan is saying, it's very easy to do the hands-on anastomosis on the robot. You just... See, you need to see it and learn the system and learn the technique. And then the learning curve is not that steep. Uh, you know, it is something that you have to do, especially now that we're doing more SADIs. It's extremely difficult to do a SADI with the linear stapler. Uh, I mean, it's it's being reported, but I don't like the, the technique. So most of us are doing SADIs in a hands-on fashion. So if you learn how to do a hands-on anastomosis, then I think that opens doors for you. And there's nothing you can do out there, even when you're dealing with a very tough, complicated case like that. Even if I'm doing an esophagus J, by the way, I line up this the jejunum to the esophagus and do the anastomosis exactly the same way you saw in the video. Wonderful. Well, I'm going to open one more opportunity for a question. If not, I'm going to wrap it up. Anybody? 
Maher, this was really wonderful. I Thank it's, you guys. I learned a lot. It gave me a new understanding of of how I can apply robotics more to my practice. And I'm just getting to the point where I'm starting to book some revisional cases. I'm still at that point That's where, awesome. you know, I'm being careful about what I do. But um, again, I'm only able to do that because I've done the the easier ones. Yeah, yeah. So with that, um, I'm just going to remind you guys to embrace this new technology, embrace the future, embrace AI and computer assisted surgery, because that's where it's going. And you guys are on the forefront of this. And I congratulate you all for showing up and for um, your attendance today. I know Dr. Martin has been very strict about that. So I do want to congratulate Stacy Kubovic, who for a while was logged on twice on two devices. So Stacy, you get, you get kudos for that. <laughs> all right, guys. Thank, thank you very you much. And look forward to our next uh, session. Is it the open house? It's next, Morgan. Morgan's not with us anymore. Okay. Uh, I believe it's an open house and we'll have some great stuff to discuss there. And um, once again, thank you, Dr. Alcharos. Wonderful. Thank you, Adrian. Thank you, guys.